and we're live and i didn't break the internet this time so that's a win all right welcome back thank you for for seeing us all again you lovely lovely people hey all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the blasters and blades podcast just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies a place where magic is king the sky is the limit and space is the place the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction so without further ado we're going to let our guest mr colin glassy introduce himself to our listeners and viewers so colin can you tell us who you are Hi, I'm Colin Glassy. I'm a uh, fantasy uh, writer. I've gotten finished four novels so far, uh, and I've also created the audiobooks for the four, and I've also done a number of other books as well. I, this year, I published A History of Vietnam, which is not fantasy, but and then uh, coming out in the month is a, a, a very different book that was is literally set in the year 2021 in the pen minutes of the pandemic. And the idea just occurred to me for a storyline, and so I wrote it. Outstanding. And while he is a history nerd, just like yours truly, dear listener, we will try not to go too far afield. Normally, Doc's here with the, the hooked cane to rein us back in, but she is busy doing Dragon Con things, so you're stuck with it. If we go down a rabbit hole, we apologize for nothing. Uh, and so the, the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we first found them. So uh, uh, Colin is another one of those ones that I got introduced to by Declan when I said we had some cancellations over the summer. You know, kids, life, it happens. Uh, and so because it was just the, the, um, August was a crazy month for people that um, some school districts, it's their back to school build up. So anyway, uh, I reached out to Declan and he goes, oh, I've got a bunch of people. And before I knew it, August and part of September was filled. So uh, we're glad that he did. Friend of the show did uh, did us a favor. But uh, before we get started on this interview, Mr. Colin, you have to answer the religion question. Star Wars, Star Trek or Firefly? Well, I've seen all three and I actually remember watching the original Star Trek episodes when they came out. I am that old and I love them. Um, but my favorite is, in fact, Babylon 5. Uh, I actually communicated with uh, Mr. J. Michael Straczynski over the internet back in when the series was uh, being broadcast, and, and it was a lot of fun to see that being played out in real time and have some tiny, tiny little input into the, uh, into the directions of the stories and stuff. But yeah, I'm a huge Trek fan. I also saw Star Wars the weekend that it opened in San Francisco at the Coronet Theater, which is an event that remains blazed in my mind. It was so much fun. We waited in line for hours to see that film. Well worth it. And uh, that was back in the time before smartphones. So you actually had to introduce or entertain yourself while you waited people and talk to people and stuff. Weird, yeah. I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Oh boy! Yeah, I'm so excited to see that film. Yeah, the running joke I remember when people were like, "Oh, we're they were worried about the zombie apocalypse, but it's already here, and it's a line of people walking down the streets, all staring at their phone instead of like living." Uh, <laughs> but anyway, now I'm going to sound old. All right, because we are polytheistic and we don't want to talk about how old I am or am not, uh, we're going to ask you this one: Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, or the Wheel of Time? Yeah, well, again, I've read all of those, but my heart and soul are with The Lord of the Rings. It's actually one of the very first books I ever read, and I've read it many times since. And in fact, my series is inspired by a single line in the third novel. There was one line that I was reading, and it just struck me that, hey, that's actually an interesting plot line there, which... Tolkien just passes over without any further comment. And it really inspired me reading that line. Suddenly the, the, the pieces fell into place and I suddenly had an idea for a fantasy novel of my own. So yeah, it's uh, Lord of the Rings for me. That is a standard answer. Um, so we just, we tried to give the, uh, the most iconic properties we could think of, but man, how do you compete with Lord of the Rings? I mean, I know, George R. R. Martin has tried with Game of Thrones. He's sort of a grimdark a take on Lord of the Rings, I would say, but 
yeah, yeah that's that's a... so. um and i i really liked uh the first two uh novels in the wheel of time by jordan were really very interesting and and uh and he had a very interesting take on things it just started dragging out too long for me i i gave up on the series after book seven or something like that 800 pages or whatnot um and of course we've all had to give up on martin's work since he refuses to finish it um but yeah, the initial Martin, I was very impressed by the first uh, novel uh, in that series. Um, it was good. And, uh, you know, anyways, <laughs> it happens. I very much hope to finish my series before I kick the bucket. The uh, the joke is that Brandon Sanderson will finish it for him. But Brandon mm -hmm. has actually spoke on that. He's like, no, no, I will not be writing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. I have a funny story about Mr. Sanderson. So I oh, went, go ahead. I went to a writer's conference. It's actually, actually took, took place on a cruise ship and Sanderson was going to be there and he ended up canceling at the last minute. So uh, we didn't actually get to spend any time with him, but I did end up occupying his suite on the cruise ship, which was very nice, <laughs> very nice suite on the cruise ship. I'm not sure why I got his suite, but I guess everybody else already had their suites assigned and they go, well, Sanderson's not available. <laughs> Who's going to get that one? So they gave it to me and another roommate. So That is awesome. So uh, a cruise, I can't imagine being trapped like that. That uh, It's called that's the Writing Excuses and it's actually um, a fairly well-known individuals are in it. Mary Robinette is, was uh, one of the featured um, people on there. We actually had, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, anyways, it was it was an interesting experience. I, I enjoyed it, um, but, you know. Well, I mean, it's... Uh... It's not the it's not the the people. It's just the being trapped like that. When sometimes you know you just got to move it around. But I know Lindsay Baroker did one where they took a train to New Orleans and they all just rode the train in a sleeper car and wrote like dragon novels or something. Oh, uh, she's so talked cool. about that. So <laughs> that's pretty. I mean, cool. whatever works for you. It, it's 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 one way to do it. So we here at the Blasters and Blades podcast like both the fantastical and the scientific. So what was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy? Well, it's fantasy, but I, I absolutely adore science fiction. I have, I mean, some of my favorites. I've listed my favorite novels at times, and many of them are in science fiction. I mean, Werner Vinge's A Fire Upon the Deep, um, uh, 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 Neil Stephenson's uh, The Diamond Age, uh, um, and just I've, I've actually, I used to work at a fantasy science fiction bookstore, and I've read almost every Hugo winner and many of the nominees up until the year 1980. So <laughs> I, I could never work at a bookstore. That would be like basically indentured servitude because I'd end up owing them money for all the books I bought. And I, didn't, <laughs> like, I just couldn't do it. I, I mean, hats off to people that are that disciplined, but it's just That's not a real I, danger. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Although I'm told some of them get around that by like letting you check it out library style if you get like books that are returned for whatever reason. I don't know. That's still that's still a risk though, because you, you end up wanting more than that's in the program. So what was your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction? You said it was fantasy first. So do you remember your first uh fantasy experience? Well, yes, we traveled uh, with my family, and uh, I invented a whole storyline as we were traveling across the country, um, uh, and I was entertaining my younger brother with these uh, interesting sort of fantastical creatures based, uh, I have to admit, on our stuffed animals that we brought with us. But uh, they had uh, all sorts of interesting adventures along the way and uh, lots of enemies, too, in the form of some of the rather disgusting monster creatures that we were given, like a spider. That was our chief enemy or my chief enemy in my story. So <laughs> I had, we had lots and lots of stories about that, which I made up. But uh, I'll never forget our battles with the sp evil spider creatures. Was it uh, interactive with your siblings or was it um, you were just telling the tale and they were riding along 
for the ride. It was pretty interactive. I mean, you know, they, <laughs> I, I'm all, not very old at the time. So, yeah, it was it was pretty interactive. But it was definitely my inspiration. I thought it was all perfectly normal at the time. I mean, it sounds normal to me, but, you know, <laughs> we'll see. So what is it about speculative fiction writ large that you love? That's a good question. Wow. Um, as an historian, I'm very interested in how the past played out. And it always struck me that the world that we lived in was highly variable, meaning that it could have happened lots and lots of different ways. And so it's very easy to think about how the future could turn out in lots and lots of different ways, too. I absolutely don't believe that anything is set in stone. I'm a complete, I, I'm much as I love Sam Clemens or Mark Twain, I totally disagree with his belief that uh, the future is set. There's destiny. I don't believe in that. He was an interesting character full of lots of interesting beliefs. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes. I, I, so, I, I like Clemens a lot. I've read a, a fair amount of his work and, and he's such a wonderful writer and he's so funny. But uh, yeah, his his notion that we're all destined to do certain things, uh, no. So how did your love of speculative fiction transition from, like, I love reading these stories or even just casually telling my siblings to, I'm going to write a novel and sell it to the masses? Like, what was that transition like for you? Well, I read a very important thing from Gene Wolfe. He published, he's one of my favorite authors, and he published a book about his writing of his magnum opus, The Shadow of the Torturer, The Earth of the New Sun series. His book was called, I think it was called The Castle of the Otter, um, collection of, uh, of stories and essays about writing. And one of the things that I took to heart was, he said, if you can stop writing, then stop. And so for 30 years, I took that advice and I stopped writing. I started writing when I graduated from college. I had this whole idea for a science fiction series that was going to be bigger and more elaborate than, uh, than anything that existed. Um, uh, but I, I stopped I stopped and I went on and I did all sorts of other things like programming computers and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, becoming an attorney. So, but then I started again. Well, that answers that question. You can't, you couldn't stop it. Just a long intermission. Yes. Long so intermission. many authors will let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that shape you as a storyteller? Uh, sure. If we want to talk about the Burning Tower in particular, the Burning Tower is a travel across a landscape. Most of the novel, about a third of it, is in fact a long journey. And it was absolutely inspired by uh, uh, my family's travels across the United States. We drove back and forth across the United States. And this is in the days before air conditioning, at least on two of those trips. Um, you know, by car, and it was a multi-day experience, and it was seared into my memory, this traveling over the vast expanse of uh, Kansas, and uh, we, we traveled on I-80, so if you're familiar with the, the flight path from, uh, say, New York to uh, San Francisco, that's what you fly over, um, and uh, it's just, it's big, the United States is big, and, and I've seen a lot of it. So that was the, that was a hugely important for uh, for uh, experience that I wanted to convey in in the first novel, long travel across a big land. That is a a good reason to do it. I when everyone talks about traveling abroad, and I, I keep thinking, yeah, there are places I'd like to see, but there's so much of America I haven't even seen yet that I'd like to start there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually did deliberately set for my fantasy world, although it's not so easy to tell. My fantasy world is actually based on the geography of the United States. I did that deliberately because I think so many fantasies are essentially based in Europe. And I wanted to do a fantasy that was based in this country. So I imagine what it would be like if this country had been settled not you know by your by civilized or you know uh, advanced technology people not in 17 or 1600 but instead in the year like 200 
how would that have been different? What would they have done? And so one of the major cities in my world is a very unimportant city in, 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 in the present world, Paducah, Paducah, Kentucky. It's, uh, it's on the Ohio River, but it's in a beautifully situated spot. And so in my opinion, in, in, if we had settled this country earlier, Paducah would be a major town. <laughs> I mean, if nothing else, it's got the gravitas of the name. <laughs> well, I renamed everything. So, but uh, so let's transition from the from the writing side then and talk about things a little bit from from the fan angle. So, have you gotten any cool fan art or had anyone cosplay your characters yet? No, not yet. It's so disappointing, but <laughs> there's always time. Well, then, if uh, if you are dear listener, re listen to this interview and say, "Man, that book sounds awesome. Let me read it." And then you're so inspired to make some art or do some cosplay. If you sign up on the link below to his website and newsletter and such, he would love to see it. I, I can't imagine a single author that would say, no, don't show me that. So you could do your part, dear listener, and make his day for as little as a cup of coffee. I don't know. It's a bad info, Marshall. We'll move on. No, it's uh, I, I, you know, I one promise. That, there's a great story ahead. that Gene Wolfe uh, uh, relates, and he talks about one of the one of the two central origin points for his uh, series, the, uh, the the Earth of the New Sun. One of them is his own experience as a young man who ends up going to war. In his case, he went to the Korean War. He served and fought in the Korea in 1954 or 52. And uh, the other experience he wanted to convey was having a character who had such a great costume that people would dress up as it. And so he really wanted to make a world that was so... Uh, evocative and um and and flamboyant that people wouldn't want to dress up as his characters so there we go if wolf wanted that i do too that's that's an interesting because i've been thinking about that like everyone has tried to be so tolkien is the father of we'll say fantasy uh, he might not be exactly so you literary snobs can just at doc she wants all the hate mail but um he was very descriptive in everything. I mean, I, and I dig description, so I don't have a problem with it. I know lots of people were like, oh, okay, like I get it. It's a blade of grass. So modern writing has almost gone the other direction where they don't describe anything and they leave so much up to your imagination. But then if you're wanting to cosplay something, how do you do that when you can't visual? I mean, like you're left sort of interpreting, interpreting it in a way that may be vastly different. So I, I do kind of like the idea that you wrote enough description that someone could if they wanted to. Yeah, I, well, I was trying, but I think it's a very good question that you raise. It's a very interesting issue. Um, and it's one of the reasons which I think makes uh, graphic novels more attractive. Uh, I mean, uh, a, a number of people are, are exploring this or, you know, creating these things. Um, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of value, I think, to creating a, a more a graphical representation of your story. Um, you don't have to describe it anything. You don't have to describe the, the, the setting. You don't describe the, the weapons. It's all on the page. That would make it easier. So I've actually so I'm a huge fan of Marco Cluse in his Frontline series for, for military sci fi. It's masterfully written. He had a graphic, a series of graphic novels come out in that universe. And the story for those was only kind of meh. But I bought it even knowing that because the reviews like heavily slammed it. Because I just wanted to see the artistic interpretation of all the stuff, like the uniforms, the aliens, and all that. So even if that's the only reason you buy one of those kinds of things, like that alone has value, I think. That's interesting, though, that it was actually, uh, uh, at least in the opinion of some people, it, it turned into a less successful novel. Yeah, I worry about that, too. I know how to write novels. I'm not sure I know how to write a graphic uh, 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 a graphic thing. There's this guy, you, you probably know him, the, uh, the guy who wrote that long-running French graphic novel series. It got made, one of the episodes got made into a movie by... Luc Besson, um, four years ago, The City of a Thousand Stars. I've forgotten the name of this. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I watched the movie. It was good. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I think but they were anyway, coming at it. The guy who wrote that, and he was a writer, and he did all the writing. He just he was a very capable individual, and he could have written novels if he had chosen to. But he said, nope, this is my this is my 
genre. I'm going to write the the text for illustrated graphic novels. And then I get, he has a very close friend who illustrated almost all of his uh, all of his books. He later on began using other artists. Um, but it was a deliberate self-conscious decision. And clearly he could have decided to write novels if he'd wanted to. Um, I think, I, I mean, I've, so one of our co-hosts on the show, Nick Garber is a comic book artist and he, I mean, he publishes his own comic books. And so I've, you know, we've discussed this on and off air. So like I get as a storytelling medium, like there is room for that. I'm not saying the the genre itself is problematic. I just think this particular one didn't land for me. Yeah. But I knew it probably wouldn't from the reviews and I bought it just for the value of the art. I almost would have bought it if it was just the art with no story, um, you know, because it, it was it was just that you know one more piece of immersion into the world. Yeah, that's an idea. And I, I mean, like, I think I think it's one of the themes, or even just like you know, with sci-fi, it's the ship, or you know, I guess in fantasy, it's the dragon, the castle, the what the armor looks like, you know, whatever it is. Because I think the take on modern fantasy is less. Uh, Eurocentric knight in shining armor. I mean, they have armor, but I think they've started getting so stylistic with the way they describe it um, that it gives room for personality that that you know an image could convey better than potentially a description. Mm. Yeah, I wonder how much of that is inspired by the um, the Tolkien, the take of Tolkien from like the 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 movies that came out. And some of the the RPGs that are out there, you know, that have their own sort of fantastical armor. Right. I, I played World of Warcraft for many, many years. And my God, you can't beat the ridiculous, flashy, absurd shoulder armor in World of Warcraft. <laughs> oh, I have glowing, spinning purple orbs over my shoulders. Like, well, I have red lightning bolts over mine. And the funny thing is, is if you get armorers looking at it and like having heart attacks about why it would never work and you'd never be able to move them, like it looks cool though, right? Rule of cool has, has yep. value. Yep. Yep. Oh boy. So has anyone ever asked for your autograph since you started writing? Uh, yes, actually. But um, uh, it was by mistake. Uh, so I was in Korea and one of the uh, Korean uh, students uh, uh, mistook me as one of the professors and, and thought that I should, uh, she should get my autograph. And I had to uh, politely uh, 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 inform her that I was in fact a, a fellow student, just somewhat older than she was. So, yeah. So why would, God. so the professors or celebrity enough people would want a professor's autograph? Well, it's possible there was more going on. There was possible there's a subtext going on there. She was trying to make a sort of a uh, uh, a gesture which the other students would be jealous of. Yeah, okay. I'm not entirely sure. It was it, it was an it was an interesting situation. I, I very much enjoyed. I love visiting South Korea. I hardly recommend it. And my God, it's so much fun. Um, and uh, you know, there's just it, it, for for me as an historian and as someone who's interested in the future. Uh, when I visited Seoul ten years ago, it was literally like being ten years or five years in the future. It was incredible. <laughs> I came back to the Bay Area and I thought, oh my God, we're behind the times. Here we are in Silicon Valley and we're behind the times. Well, what is it that uh, that gives it that futuristic vibe? Is it the just the ambiance? Is it you know, more of the shiny lights. What do you, what is it do, that does it for you? Well, everything there, uh, almost everything there that you would interact with is brand new. And, and it's, you know, you go on the freeway and the freeways have been built in the last 10 years and you go on their subway system and their subway system has been built in the last 10 years. And uh, they've got these flat, they had, it was, this is 10 years ago, they had flat panel advertising displays all over the city. And it was like, oh, animated, animated flat panel uh displays and and uh, it was really I mean we still don't have a lot of those things they're not very common and and here they were all over the place in Seoul it's true that outside of Seoul so in some of the other cities that I visited it was much less futuristic in fact it was not futuristic at all uh, it was actually very normal but Seoul is incredible <laughs> okay I, uh, I almost got stationed there, but they ended up sending me to Iraq again. So I don't know if I won or lost that one. But Mesopotamia can be beautiful, too. 
uh, when they're not shooting at you, that is. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the part where we move on and we ask you about everything that you have written. So what is your body of work for people that haven't had a chance to, per to read it yet? Okay, so the first novel is the one that's on the screen, The Burning Tower. It's a volume one in the series, and it's followed by volume two, The Fire Sword, followed by volume three, The Flame Iris Temple, and the most recent book in the series, which I finished last year, is called The Wind Mage. Uh, and then, in addition to that, I have this uh, history of Vietnam, which I call A Thousand Blocks of Jade, which I published this year. I've been working on that for a very long time, but the, the COVID pandemic had me shut in, and so I decided to finish up that book that I'd been working on for so long. And then my new novel is called The Cure of All Disease, and it's literally set in July and August of 2021. And it has to do with the COVID pandemic. Very different from everything that I've written before, but had to do it. That is uh, definitely one that will um, get some attention. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the indifferent. So while all of that sounds fascinating, obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, low bandwidth means we didn't have video today. But uh, we're here to talk about The Burning Tower, which is specifically book one of the Secret Journey series. So where did you get the premise for this universe? How did you come up with the idea that became the series? So the series is a, an, an, a imagine if Marco Polo had traveled not at the time that he did. And if you know Chinese history, the time that he did travel is the time when China was ruled by the Mongols. Uh, Kublai Khan is the grandson of Genghis Khan, and he was running in charge of China when Marco Polo and his father arrived there. And Marco Polo left around the time or shortly before Kublai Khan died. So he only saw China under the control of the Mongols. And I was thinking about what if people came to China at a different time. And there's a very specific different time that I was thinking of. And that is the fundamental storyline that I had. What if somebody starting out in England travels to China at a different time and sees a very different situation? It's essentially a civil war is underway. We don't tend to think of China as having too many civil wars, but they did. And uh, when you when you when you're a stranger and you come to a country when there's a civil war going on, anything can happen. So, what is it specifically about China that is uh, that draws you in like that enough to inspire a book series? Okay, well, um, I think that China is is the will be uh, the most important adversary or frenemy. For the United States for the rest of our lives. There's, I don't think there's any reasonable chance that China is going to disappear in the next 80 years. It's going to be there and it's really, really powerful and very important. And basically very few people in the United States and I think in Europe as well really have much of an understanding of what that country is about. So I'm attempting to rectify that in my own small way. I think at least specifically with China, people can get the country and the culture mixed up with modern politics and it's not necessarily one and the same. They had a, a vibrant culture before um, things became what they are today and we'll just you know leave it at that. So we stay apolitical and I think sometimes people can forget that in the modern world. Oh, so absolutely. it's, it's definitely... I'm sure that's a, it's a huge factor, and it's probably um, well. I'll give you I'll give you one piece of information which I found really shocking. Last before the COVID epidemic occurred in 2018, there were 350,000 Chinese students here in the United States at American universities. By contrast, in that same year, there were 16,000 Americans studying in China. So roughly 25 to one. The Chinese understand the United States a lot better than we understand it. 
And that's not a good strategy. That's not a good situation if you're actually engaged in some sort of global competition for the future. No, I, I can't imagine that that is. <laughs> so, all right. So before we, we dive too deeply in the book, we're going to take a second where we uh, talk about this cover, which is on the screen if you're watching. And if not, uh, I encourage you to click the link uh, and, and check it out on his website. That'll be in the show notes because the, the, the art is glorious. But what is the story with this piece of art? Like, how did how did you come up with it? It's definitely, it stands out even in miniature on a thumbnail on the Amazon page. Uh, thank you. It's very kind of you. Um, this is a scene uh, from the very end of the book. Um, and in fact, there really is, as you can imagine, a tower that has been set on fire. Uh, and people on the top of the tower are uh, in turn firing burning arrows down at their enemies. So yeah, that was... Uh, it's a, it's a scene that's in the book. It's not just a, a cool idea. Oh, and the magic sword. Yes, he's got a magic sword. It's uh, and it's uh, it's 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 nice to have. It, it's not hugely. It's not like in the Lord of the Rings. There's a, a a very important magic sword which our major hero Aragorn is carrying. And it's like a symbol of kingship, and it's you know comes back from the ancient days, and it's the sort of sword that that the kings of Gondor once uh, carried, and so by him having it reforged, it's now sort of a demonstration of his authority. My magic sword is much less significant uh, than that, and it's deliberate because I just didn't want to play with that with that whole oh I've got a magic sword, therefore I'm the most important person in the world storyline it's like nope i just happen to have a magic sword all right that's a, that's a cool way to do it and it still makes an evocative image but before we dive any deeper we are going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man or in this case the woman a single blip on her instrument panel brings boss to a halt alone on her spaceship in a remote quadrant she drops below light speed and listens hearing a blip like that makes her heart pound it means a faint energy signature from an unknown source, somewhere nearby, most likely a ship. Boss specializes in abandoned ships. She dives them for salvage. But this is like nothing she's ever seen, probably because she knows it can't be there. All of her knowledge of history, physics, and space wrecks says it's impossible. But if it's what she thinks, it could hold the key to a tremendous technological advance, one that no one in the universe should have. Called Page Turning Space Adventure by Publishers Weekly, Diving into the Wreck by Christine Catherine Rush is classic science fiction at its most gripping. Find all seven novels in the award-winning diving series at divingintotherec.com. All right, thank you for sticking with us through that uh, commercial interlude. We appreciate the sponsorship and your uh, patronage, dear listeners. So if that sounds interesting, go uh, click the link in the show notes and check it out. But uh, now we're back with Mr. Colin Glassy, and we're talking about The Burning Tower. So what would your 30-second elevator pitch for this novel be? It's a novel of exploration, adventure, and... It has a, a strong connection to historical events of our world. So it's, uh, I call it an historic fantasy adventure. Okay. And what is it you think that makes the um, series, The Secret Journey, um, and specifically The Burning Tower, special? Well, I think it's done a... Um, a unique job of exploring a different culture on a, its own terms. Um, so our characters, the ones that we're following, are Westerners. They're essentially like English people, um, but they're being thrown into uh, um, another culture, and they have to deal with it not as the heroic saviors, um, not as the chosen ones who everyone is going to worship, but they have to deal with it just like they're there. And, you know, people are going to try and take advantage of them, and they have to navigate their way through this, uh, through this situation. And 
hopefully come out at the end with their uh, with their lives and honor intact. Always an important consideration. So we'll narrow it down to just the burning tower, but what tropes do you feel like that uh, novel hits the best? Well, I think it does a very good job of um, um, getting a landscape uh, and and people's relationship to the land. Uh, this is something that I that I very much wanted to borrow from Tolkien, where his a lot of the first novel, The Fellowship of the Ring, is really about we're journeying across a landscape. And in fact, this is also true in the second and third novels, really. It's very much a, uh, the landscape is a character in the novels. And I was attempting to do something like that in The Burning Tower as well, is, is really present um, uh, people, and in particular, a group of people's reaction to the landscape. This is a very important part of the story for me was that I wanted to show um, a group of men, capable men, uh, you know, essentially trained warriors, uh, making their way through difficult circumstances, coming together as a group and, um, and, and forging on through uh, uh, and coming together really as a, as a team. Um, and I, I just don't, I didn't think that, this was ex uh, drawn from my own experience as I, I spent years working in teams and they just, they seemed important to me. And I, uh, I very much want to portray uh, uh, teamwork and how it plays out. Okay, that is um, an interesting take for a series and you've definitely uh, got me interested, so. Uh, I'll be looking for the audiobooks uh, when my when my credits reset. Cool. But uh, what? But I, what would say, I would hope that it would actually have some appeal to people that have uh, served in the military, because I believe that military service uh, in the modern era, especially, is all about teamwork. Um, your platoon is your family. Absolutely, and uh, that was the joke when we would deal with. You know, some of us would go home while we were. It, well, specifically the enlisted kind, and we'd go home, and some of the people we went to high school with talk about their fraternity, and you realize that you know what's that, but your small unit kind of thing. With we had cooler guns, though. At least I hope so. <laughs> I, if they had better guns, then maybe they don't want to tell the uh, FTA and any of the alphabet agencies or ATF, not FTA. Wow, been a long day, people. But uh, what subgenre or genres do you think the story fits best into? Obviously, fantasy, but but are there others? Um, uh, it's a, I don't, there are some other works that are like this. There's a, a, a pretty well-known author, Guy Gavriel Kay, who actually spent some time working with Tolkien. And later on, after Tolkien died, he worked with uh, Tolkien's son, Christopher Tolkien, on getting what turned into the Silmarillion into publishable shape. And then Mr. Kay went off and has had a very successful career writing um, uh, historical fantasies, uh, where I believe they're historical fantasies, where he's, he's, he's added magic into the world, but nevertheless, it's pretty obvious to those people who know what his background is for the story. I mean, one of my favorites and one of his most popular works is A Song for Arabon. It's really based on the history of the province of Narbonne, which used to be an independent state, occupying the coast of France, southern coast of France, as well as Barcelona. And it ultimately ended up getting divided between, you know, the kingdoms of Spain and, um, and the kingdom of France. So it's no longer a separate country. But uh, Kay, Kay went on and did a number of other novels in the same sort of field. He's not the only one. I, I grew up reading works by Rosemary Sutcliffe. She's not so much fantasy. She tried to stay pretty close to the history, but it's still an act of imagination. Um, you know, it, the, the only question really in, in historical fantasy is how much fantasy are you including <laughs> when you're going to write about the past? It's very difficult to not you know, sort of interject your own ideas about what's going on. And that can be an interesting problem because when you when you think about culture, like everything develops, like 
in a, in like together. So sometimes if you try to apply modern sensibilities to people that are living rural agrarian lives, like is most fantasy with, you know, insert magic, whatever, like it doesn't always mesh. And those are the, the fantasy stories that sort of fall flat. Uh, it's only when you can understand like that they would think differently than you and, and ration that or like reason that out that it really sticks. And that's, that's why certain novels are classics and others just sort of fade from view. Well, I think it's a very, uh, you know, what you brought up is a very difficult and interesting question. My response is that um, one of the lessons that I learned uh, about history, and I majored in history in college, was that when historians choose to write about a particular time period, they are doing so because something in the present era has is resonating with them in relation to the event that they're talking about in the past. I mean, there are million, million events that we could all write about, as historians could write about. Why choose to write about this particular event? Why choose to write about this particular person? And it has to do with, uh, the reason is because it makes, it resonates with you, the historian, in the present day. So we are always looking at the past through our own eyes, through the present day's eyes. Now we can try and do as good a job as we can in understanding how people act, acted and thought in the past, but we really can't. I can't. I can't put myself in the position of a person who grew up in, in 1350. I can't. Uh, I can try, and I can certainly make a good faith effort to it. But the reality is, this is a story that is motivated by present day concerns just as Tolkien's works was motivated by present day concerns. He was very clearly motivated by his own experience of World War I and the looming horror of World War II. And he, of course, ended up surviving World War II and the book wasn't published until after the war was safely over. But he started it in 1937 before the war had even started. And I imagine just knowing what I know of the Psalm, like the battle he survived, like that, that kind of has a way of, Imprinting itself on your soul, I would say. Absolutely. So I, I can imagine. I will say that one of the things that modern historians try to counter that with is the, the reliance on primary sources. But even those, you know, written at the time can have their biases. So you're right. It's still always a guesswork, even when we're reading it from their own words. Oh, yeah. Um, because even with that, you know, you can't really understand why they're choosing to write what they're choosing to write. You, you can't get inside their head. Even when they're writing, here's what happened. Why did you choose to write this? But anyways, we're now we're getting into the minutia. Of, of right, right. And see, this is where Doc would normally put us back on the primrose path. But let's talk about the story itself. So what can you tell us about your main character? So my main character is somebody who's um, got a fairly uninteresting desk job within uh, um, a late medieval government. Um, and suddenly he's given a new task by the king. And the king of the country says, hey, I want you to do X. And he hasn't previously done X, but the king says, I want you to go out and explore. You're, you're available. You, you've, you found this, this map, which seems to lead somewhere. I want you to go out and do it. And I'm going to give you some men to help. Um, but it's, it's basically your job. Um, and you know, you can understand why this is going to arouse a certain amount of trepidation in, in your character when you're forced into doing something that you weren't trained to do, but then who's really ever trained to be an explorer? It's really just sort of either you choose to do it on your own and there have been people like that, or you get assigned this task by, by the higher authority. Um, and, uh, off you go. And again, this is kind of like what it's like in the military. <laughs> you don't have a choice as to what your position, what your task is assigned. Um, you basically are having to follow orders. And this is, again, a group of men, and they've been given a task, and they've got to accomplish it or not necessarily die trying, but maybe close. Helps if I unmute. So what is it you think that makes this main character and his uh, cast of... Uh cohorts unique in the crowd of crowded field of fantasy well i hope that i've added some level of humility you know the main character is obviously derived from who you are it's who i am and you know clearly <laughs> i don't think any main characters are not the author uh maybe there are a few examples 
Um, but again, Gene Wolfe, he did the exact same thing. His main character is him. He's a young man and he's been going off to war. So my main character is me. And uh, I've been given a task that I wasn't really particularly equipped or trained for. And uh, off I go. And that's, you know, it's, I, I think that I can, I think I can write that because it's been my life to some degree. We'll see. Um, uh, yeah. So were there any secondary characters that were uh, in this novel that were especially memorable to you? So one of the secondary characters ends up being the main character in the fourth novel. So he's from uh, a wilder part of the country. Um, and he's gets essentially Shanghai into this whole journey um, by accident to a degree. He was available and he knew something about the territory, at least part of the territory, because he's from there. And uh, so, um, again, he's, the, he's basically given a, a, a terrible choice, which is either stay here in jail or go with this other guy on this uh, expedition to hopefully discover um, uh, a path through the mountains. And he doesn't have any real expectation that they're going to be able to accomplish this, but they do. So he's, a, he's kind of the odd man out in this whole group because he's not part of the military. He wasn't given this task by the king. He, he got given this task by, you know, it's, it's his own choice in a sense. I mean, you know, he could have stayed where he was, um, but he agrees to go along. And he also had known our main character from earlier. So they, they, they had been friends. And uh, so he has a good reason to join, but he is a different, he has a different take on these, uh, on this whole thing. And he's, that's a, that's a constant struggle for this other character. His name is Cagney. And it's a constant struggle that he has is because he says, I, why am I here? He's asked, he gets to ask that question pretty darn often. Why am I here? Whereas the other characters, they know why they're there. They got given this task. One is a knight and the other has been given this task by the king of the, king of the country. Um, but Cagnade, he has to answer that question for himself. And so he has some interesting adventures along the way because he actually has choice. He can choose to, at any moment. He can say, that's it. I'm through. I'm going off on my own. You guys are, you guys are on your own. Um, so he has, he has the, he has that interesting aspect of choice to his character, um, which I then take away from him in the fourth book. So <laughs> definitely sounds interesting. So what about bad guys? Is this a uh, sort of like man versus nature as the bad guy or there, um, is there a principled, uh, a antagonist that they, they face off against without spoilers, obviously. Right, without spoilers. So the bad guys are, in fact, the people that are currently or attempting to rule the country that they end up in, which is my version of China. So that means the bad guys are the Mongols, and they are, in fact, bad. They are they not they're not doing a very good job, and the country is revolting and uh, are against them, and they're responding with. Uh, the sort of typical bad behavior you expect out of Mongols, which is wholesale slaughter, burning, etc. And there, there's a particular leader um, who is uh, decides that he's going to get rid of um, these uh, mine characters. So they have they have an antagonist, and he tries to kill them on several occasions. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, that's the the man against nature is an important part of the first book but it disappears in the second one because or almost disappears in the second one because in the second book now our characters my characters are in a civilized settled nation and so now it's a very different sort of um uh, uh very different issues first book has absolutely got man some uh, element of man against nature which i enjoyed writing Okay. So speaking of characters, uh, it sounds like you put yours through the ringer. So if they met you in a dark alley and they knew that you were the Colin Glass that was the arbiter of their doom, how do you see that interaction playing out? Ooh. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I, have, uh, I have avoided trying to think about that sort of meta-analysis <laughs> as to what would my characters think if they were actually part of a story um, actually, for them so far, the story has gone pretty well. I mean, some of their people have died, and um, so not all the people in their party have have, have lived through this. Uh, and they've certainly gone through um, 
a number of very difficult uh, adventures, but overall things have gone well for them. So I don't think they'd be too complaining. Okay. I have a fundamentally optimistic view on the world. So my characters, I mean, you know, in Tolkien, how many characters does Tolkien, does Tolkien actually kill off? Well, he tried killing off Gandalf, but then he brought him back. And he tried killing off Boromir, but then he brings Boromir back in the form of his younger and absolutely better in all respects brother, Faramir. So who does he actually kill off? And the answer is he only kills off a very few minor, unimportant characters in the story, except at the very end when he kills Saruman. It's like, oh, well, he deserved to die. So, And, of course, the, the unnamed foe, you know, in mass. Yep, yep. So, but they had it coming, you know. Yep. They had it coming. Orcs, kill them all. <laughs> so since we talked about characters, do you have a favorite character archetype when you write? Yeah, and uh, it, it really is the wizard. And uh, um, I I was a, a big fan of Ursula Le Guin and her series, The Wizard of Ursies. I actually met her um, and uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and so I'm... I, I'm, I was very impressed by her storyline about training a person to use magic. And there's a reason for it. And the reason is perfectly clear is when you're a computer programmer, as I was for many years, you're literally creating a world out of nothing. You just write magical incantation software code in a word processor and then you press the button and you out activate the compiler and lo and behold stuff magically happens on the screen you click buttons things happen it's very much like magic so yeah i'm very fond of the magic user archetype it's uh, it's near and dear to my heart that is a good answer um do you feel like archetypes play a large role in fantasy or is it um not as big a deal in your genre I think it's very important. I, I think that uh, <clears throat> the big difference between arc, between fantasy and science fiction is that uh, I believe that science fiction is about let us introduce a new twist to the technology of the day and play with it. Let's see what happens. If What if we could do this? What if we could do that? But I, I think you really, uh, I mean, not all fantasy, not all science fiction is like this, but I think a lot of science fiction is best served by having very ordinary people, not archetypes at all, very ordinary people, because what's really interesting is we've changed the technology and people, ordinary people have to react to it. It has to be believable. And I think the difference with fantasy is that fantasy is about archetypes. We're dealing, I think, most of the time with uh, archetype of the warrior, the archetype of the priest, the archetype of the wizard, the archetype of the lovers, the archetype of the witch. Um, and we're playing with these archetypes. We're putting them on a stage that is, you know, familiar to us. It's the Middle Ages, knights, uh, unknown worlds, you know, monsters in the sea. And we're playing with these archetypes and seeing how they would interact with each other. Um, I mean, that's what uh, that's what the King Arthur stories strikes me as very clearly. It's just archetypes that are that are in conflict and cooperating with each other, the king, the hierophant and stuff. And and it's just it's an, it's an appealing idea to me, especially in the modern era, when it seems that there's a great deal of confusion as to who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. That was one of the motivating factors for Tolkien when he wrote his was, you know, try to create that myth and legend for, for modern readers that uh, were losing touch with what it meant to be what they were. So that's, that's a, I think that's a common theme almost in the story behind the story when you look at fantasy. Um, yeah. So I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good summary, I think, that you gave us. So... All right, so this is the part where we get to look behind the curtain, sir, and we see how the sausage was made. So were there any cool scenes or ideas that you had to cut from the Burning Tower um, that, that would make an interesting story for the listeners? Yes, there was one scene where our characters have been traveling across uh, this relatively, essentially uninhabited landscape for months, and they finally run across a new person, another person. And they can't communicate with him. He's clearly a hunter, 
um, and he's basically dressed in in skins and he's got bows and arrows and stuff like that. And he's friendly enough, but they just have no way to communicate with him. And this really brings home to them that they're in a brand new world. They are past the point where they can communicate with people by the a language and they're now going to have to do something different. But the good news is that they've met someone. And so now they know that there actually is some sort of city or habitation. And this is very important for our characters because winter is coming. And boy, if the winter sets in and they have no shelter, they'll die. So finding a hunter was very, very helpful to them. But my editor said, this seems not really adding enough to the story. So we'll cut it out. But it was inspired by a very famous um, uh, movie by Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese film director. The movie was called Ersu, Dersu Usala, and it's about this uh, group of Russian explorers who are, in fact, exploring a brand new piece of territory, which is near Vladivostok, and they run into this hunter. And uh, I thought that's such it's such a delightful film, and I heartily recommend it. It's certainly one of the one of the great films in my in my opinion. Um, so I, I wanted to include uh, my version of Dersu Utsala into the story, but it got cut. Is that uh, film available in dubbed version for those that don't speak the language? Ooh, let me think about that one. Uh, buh, 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 buh. So it was originally a Japanese Russian creation, and I think it's all in subtitles. I don't think it was ever dubbed into English. Um, all the characters, I mean, one of the characters is speaking Russian and the, the other, the hunter, Dersu Uzala, is speaking a very strange language. I think it's probably Manchurian. Um, uh, I don't think he's speaking Chinese, but uh, yep. That, that definitely sounds interesting. And the nerd in me is like, oh, let's watch this new film. Uh, so I, mean, I have a funny little uh, uh, addendum to that one. Um, okay. My second wife was actually born... Uh, on or next to that the lake that appears in that movie and i was so i was so excited when i learned that <laughs> it's instant connection it's like oh my god you've actually seen this place because it's like it's it's really it's really quite memorable when they go when they go to this lake it's lake kanka it's about 80 miles north of Vladivostok, and it's actually part of it is in china that does sound intriguing and it's uh have you been there personally or just uh, I no, about it. no, I have not been there. It's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it it actually used to be a former Japanese military base, and it's still kind of. I don't know if you can do, go there as a tourist even today because it's rather sensitive. The Russians and, or rather, the USSR and China nearly went to war over uh, a, an island in in that in the river that that flows that marks the border between that part of China and Russia. That was in the 1960s. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would make it um, a little problematic to get there, I imagine. Yeah, a little bit sensitive. So other than what you've already told us, which is sort of a Marco Polo reimagined, what can you tell us about the universe where the story is told? OK, so it's um, I did a lot of backstory for it because I'm an historian and it, that sort of stuff intrigues me. But I have an iron rule, and the iron rule is don't do more backstory than you absolutely have to. So unlike Professor Tolkien, I didn't spend years on my backstory. I spent a month or two. Um, but yeah, it's a world. It's It's got lots of different countries. It has uh, uh, different religions, um, uh, uh, many different cultures. And there's just a lot going on which underlies um, the, the, my characters and their relation to what's happening. So the kingdom that they come from is just one of many kingdoms in essentially a type of a European environment. And they're periodically at war or in alliance with each other. And there's, of course, a, a universal church, which is only actually universal amongst their, their particular regions. And so when they travel to a, a new area, then the, the, the world is different and they have to come to terms with that because they all come from a world in which there's only one church. <laughs> and now they come to a new place and it's like, that church doesn't exist. This actually causes a good deal of controversy amongst them. They do actually find uh, uh, hiding in one small disused chapel uh, the remnants of their church. And they go, oh my God, look at that. There's actually uh, a, a connection between this country and Europe of the past, which in fact is true. There was a connection. So anyways, 
yeah, it's a it's a complicated place. I try to make it as plausible and realistic as possible um, with my limited abilities. So, how much? Of, I mean, obviously, you know, we've we've covered you in American. Uh, how much of you know growing up hearing about uh, Lewis and Clark influenced this story? Because it sounds like there could be some inspiration there too. Oh, absolutely! I'm a huge fan. I mean, I I read Stephen Ambrose's book about uh, I think it's called Undaunted Courage. Mar it is, and I have marvelous story i loved reading that that was very inspirational to me because i had to think about how my characters are going to live if they're crossing territory that does not in fact have human habitation and so reading about that and about their great hunter uh um half indian uh, uh half french uh Chobano, i think is his name and every day he would go out and he would bag four deer and bring them back, and that's what the Lewis and Clark's expedition lived off of for as they were crossing the American Rockies. But no, absolutely, Lewis and Clark expedition was. Uh, I uh, the other thing that I studied um, was the travels of Captain Fremont, who in fact uh, made it across uh, from uh, St. Louis or Mississippi across to the West Coast on several occasions. He made multiple journeys, and each time he took a new route. It was amazing, the, the stuff that they did. And crossing Nevada is not easy. There are segments of Nevada where there's uh, 80, 100 miles with no water, or no drinkable water. It's just too alkaline. So I had a lot of fun studying the, the, the uh, travelers of the American, in the, American uh, in the 1800s as they were making their way across the country. It's fascinating stuff. So you said that the universe is inspired by... Um... Con China, and but you set geographically it in the U.S. Yep. So how how did the U.S. geography affect the culture as you changed it to fit in your world? Ah, excellent question. So glad you figured that one out. Yep, I um I, I didn't require as much transition or or difficulty as I thought it would, but I actually did have to keep track track of three different locations simultaneously. And the three were the real city in the United States, and you know, almost always there was a city in the United States. The anal the analog in my world to uh, my version of China, and then the analog to that to the real version of the city in China. So each city in my world has actually got three. I had to I had to create a spreadsheet for this one because it was getting complicated. So it's like Paducah equals this city, which equals this city. So it's like. But it, the, the nice thing for me is that the United States, in many respects, is very, it's not focused on the, on the ocean, right? I mean, you live on the East Coast. Um, we did have shipping, of course, but for much of the United States history, our country was focused on the interior, the, the, the westward expansion. We weren't that focused on our trade outside of uh, outside of the United States obviously you know 1900 rolls around and now and certainly certainly after World War one international foreign trade across the Atlantic was very important but in the 1800s we were focused on the interior and that actually is a good analog with China China has almost never been interested in the ocean so would someone who knows that part of you know Chinese national who's familiar with their history recognize <laughs> that in this? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've tried to get several, I have several Chinese friends and I've tried to get them to be interested in reading it, but uh, I haven't had any success yet. So, so that's a unknown, but uh, it's an interesting question when you, when you have to make some changes, but let things inspire you with the source material uh, translate. Yeah. I don't think they would. And, and the reason why, and, Let's see if I can say this politely. The reason why is that at a very deep level, the Chinese understand their country as it is, and they don't really have any tradition. There's no fantasy tradition in China other than the story of the Monkey King, which is essentially outside of China. Uh, they don't have any tradition of fantasy stories within their country. So they're not used to thinking of their country in sort of strange, non-historical ways. It's like, no, China is the way it is. And everyone knows exactly where every city is. And it's like, well, what if that city wasn't there? Or what if it wasn't important? It's like, how could that be? 
it couldn't <laughs> it couldn't be <laughs> it's like that is where it is it couldn't be anywhere else so yeah i i doubt i doubt a chinese person would actually recognize what i was doing okay well if we uh we have any chinese listeners that read this and then uh and then have a different opinion he would love to hear about it yes i so, will so uh his website will be at the show notes and you could you could reach out so the Burning Tower uh, is clearly part of a series, I know, because it says so on Amazon. You've said so. There's currently four books in this series listed, but is their story done? Will there be more from these characters? The story is not done. And yes, there's absolutely more coming. Um, I was going to write the fifth one last year, but this other, because of the pandemic, literally this other story just hit me over the hat. Uh, it was it, it came this other story the 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 cure of all disease it came to me as i was driving in a flash and i suddenly had the idea for the story and i was just laughing all the way for the next half hour and i was thinking to myself i really shouldn't do this story i really shouldn't do the story and then i thought to myself when the muse strikes follow it so i had to do it so it, uh, my, the, the 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 sequels have been delayed but not permanently they will be written okay so we know that every literary universe, at least the good ones, have their own internally consistent rules of science, technology, and or magic. Obviously, yeah. this one has magic. We can see it on the cover. So what kind of magic can we expect from these books? Yeah, well, so I'm, I've am i obviously studied uh, all of the magic systems that exist. I'm, I am I played Dungeons & Dragons for ages, and uh, I'm familiar with all the ones that have been used uh, up, in, up to Brian Sanderson's fantastic alchemy that he used in, in, in his Mistborn series, which I'm so jealous of because it's so brilliant. But anyways, um, my magic system, I tried to keep my magic system so limited that the real world would not be substantially changed by it. Um, and uh, so there isn't a great deal of magic. There is, you can in fact create an item which, you know, will cut through metal, which is nice, but it's very difficult to make such a thing. And there are very few of them that exist. Um, there are people that wield magic, but there are very few of them and they haven't changed society very much as a consequence. So th that was my... The, the underlying rationale behind the magic system is that, in fact, there are entities which can grant magical power. So that's the uh, that's the underlying basis. It's very Tolkien-esque. When you get right down to it, Tolkien's magic users have all been given their power via the gods, the Valar. And I basically copied that. Okay. So do you have a favorite uh, sort of spell or magical uh, weapon that, that you have in your universe? Well, yeah, the burning the the sword that's pictured here is 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 has this interesting and essentially almost unique ability, which is it can cut through metal like it was butter or soft cheese, and that's basically a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to have a sword like that. You can do all sorts of interesting and amusing things. One sword like that doesn't change the world, but it's still pretty nice to have. And it, you know, in in one of the books. <clears throat> it, it allows them to basically break through a locked door with ease. So it's like, normally this is a locked door and you're not going to get through without the key and you'd have to find the key. And it's like, oh, we can just slice it to pieces. <laughs> Good to have. So if you had that sword, how would you abuse it in daily life? <laughs> uh, well, bicycle locks would be no problem for me. So whenever we have a, a, a bulky bicycle lock, I just slice through the chain. And now it's like, okay, we'll just buy a new chain and a new lock. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I, I don't, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the modern age, of course, all wealth is electronic. So there's no sense in slicing your way through bank vaults to collect things. So, yeah, I would not be abusing this sword. If I had it, I'd probably find a junkyard just so I could have the fun of hacking up the cars. Because <laughs> yep. why wouldn't you? Exactly. Why wouldn't you? It's like, oh boy. Yep. <laughs> That's a good idea, indeed. I'm full of bad ideas. I mean, great ideas, depending on who you ask. <laughs> All right. So obviously, uh, you know, we've we've talked to this is fantasy, and fantasy generally has monsters, etc. Do you have that in this? Uh, the series, Fantastical Creatures? I do, um, but they're pretty uh, limited. Um, uh, 
I, the monsters, one of the reasons I, I can give you this one on the backstory. One of the reasons why it was very difficult for people, explorers, to get to my version of China is because, in fact, there are monsters in the ocean and they will destroy ships that sail close to them. So even though in theory you should be able to sail to China pretty easily, in actuality, in my world, it's really, really hard. So that's why it's been very isolated. That was my, that's one of the backstories. So the monsters, there really are huge, huge, dangerous creatures in the ocean. <laughs> Much more aggressive blue whale-like things and stuff that they're just, they, they love munching down ships. So there we go. That was done deliberately, right? I mean, if, if we could sail, then you eliminate the whole plot line of, isn't it interesting that we've discovered this new place that we can only get to by the, by traveling on foot, so. I have some other monsters as well, but they exist in uh, more of um, a spiritual realm. In other words, they cause people to go insane, um, but they're real. They're monsters, but they're they're difficult to deal with. And then I have one of the classic elements of Chinese literature are fox spirits. Fox spirits are uh, magical creatures, and they transform their shape and they can fool people very easily. So they're extremely dangerous if you get on their bad side. So that's interesting as well. I like the idea of the monsters in the ocean because if you look at some of the old maps when they when they would write, they'd be, you know, there'd be monsters on the water features because mm -hmm. it was the great unknown. So I kind of like that you took that. Just like when you see movies about aliens and there really is little green aliens as one of the races, just sort of that nod to the to the past kind of is amusing. Yep, yep. I was actually given a task to try and find such a map. This was a long time ago, but I was given this task by one of my former bosses. And he says, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to, it was for, it was for a, a bit of advertising that we were going to do. This is when I was working on uh, the uh, screensaver after dark. And he says, I'd like to get a map that has the here be, here be dragons on it. Well, I searched for it. I searched for it for a good long uh, couple of days and I couldn't find it. And recently, like within the last two months, I ran across a statement, which I can't verify, which is that those, ma those maps don't actually exist. They're all apocryphal. No map that was ever created by a European has ever said there be ma dragons here. <laughs> so really? I don't know where this story came from, but apparently they they don't exist. Those maps don't exist. They're just fairy tales. I certainly like we as a history major and as an undergrad, you definitely it's more general history. You're not doing any de in depth on one topic, and it certainly was taught as if as if that was the way it was. I know, so I that, know. I, I very much thought so. I, I mean, and so I was I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. And and I've always been on the lookout. I've always wanted to find one because it's like that's a task I wasn't able to accomplish. And I've always been on the lookout for one. And I never seen one. And then as I say, I ran across this this uh, I think it was a Quora question or something. Uh, it was very random. And it said, no, we've actually not been able to find any actual documented examples of a map. Here's a fun one for trivia for you. I have seen not re in real life, but the very good photos of um, a globe that was created just a few years before Christopher Columbus sailed and discovered the Americas. Isn't that amazing? There actually was a globe that had been made that does not include North or South America or any hint of it. That is interesting. I, I'd almost wish you took pictures so you could put it on your website so I could check it out. Uh, if you're a history nerd at all, he's got some great articles on his website. Uh, you should definitely give it a read. So, the, obviously, this doesn't apply to this series necessarily because you you let you know modern mythos sort of guide you. But if you were going to create your own magical creatures or or aliens, if if it was appropriate, how would you go about doing that? Would you let your nightmares inspire you, Mother Nature, make something up out of whole cloth? Like, how do you think as an, a creator you would go about doing that? Well. I would I would definitely rely on what I've seen in the past and and the things that scared me and so <laughs> I I would uh, you know I would absolutely be uh, be drawing on on my uh, my my childhood memories of of things that worried me that that, that frightened me I was I, I think um, uh, frightenable fright quite frightenable when I was young um, and uh, uh, so I would absolutely rely on 
um, the things that 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 very much worried me, um, creatures without heads. Uh, you know, uh, you can see some of these pictures in ancient geographies. I think that Ptolemaic geographers thought that there were actually people that had no heads. They had eyes and mouths in their chest area. And that always terrified me when I saw those pictures. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, so horrible. Um, uh, the, the, the snake creatures from the Arabian Nights, there are several of these snake creatures. I've forgotten what the dungeon, the dungeon dragons, of course, stole all the monsters you can imagine and turned them into, into creatures. I guess those are the Naga, right? Um, so Naga have always been very worrisome to me. <laughs> I can't say why. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the Nagas were, were, were very scary. <laughs> and of course, the, the Balrog from Tolkien, I, uh, it's a, a hugely terrifying creature to me. <laughs> Again, with the muting, uh, for me, I think it wouldn't be so much the monsters if I was going by nightmares, but this idea that there was quicksand everywhere just waiting to suck you in. Because mm. if you believe the 80s and 90s, that was going to be a real problem for you as you went about in the world. I have some experience with, uh, I did a lot of hiking when I was younger. Um, my family w went, we did a lot of backpacking trips and I later joined the Boy Scouts. And so I spent a lot of time out in the wilderness. Um, the things that scare me in the natural world, I have to do not so much with the natural world, but with being lost, uh, not knowing where you are and not knowing really how to get back to the, your, you know, your campsite. That's very troubling. Um, and it, it's, it's, it really, there is that sense. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I court it. I, I like when I'm, when I'm out hiking, I enjoy going out and, and sort of daring myself to say, okay, let's just head out and see how far we can go before we don't get lost and we can turn back and stuff like that. But it absolutely is a, it's a very troubling thing for me um, is the notion that you can uh, go too far and now you're lost and you have no idea. That's one of the great stories, uh, horror stories for a scuba diver, which I've done is you surface and you don't know where you are. You're just all you can see because you can't see very far when you're in the ocean. Your, your range is less than 500 feet, I think, because you're just, you know, a foot or a foot over the surface of the ocean. You can't see very far and you can easily just, you have no idea where you are. There's no sign of a boat. All there is is a blue sky, no direction. And it's like, you're in real trouble if that happens. You can die. <laughs> There's some really good um, modern sort of takes on fantasy where that happens, where the diver comes up and he's not only does he not know where he is, he's not in the same world. A lot of that is uh, the dinosaur stories where you come back and you're like in the Cretaceous or something. Like I, I've I've read and seen some good ones like that. So while I have never dived, I, I can definitely see the fear. Yeah. So I love diving. Diving was fun. I I can't do it any longer. It's a little bit uh, uh, it's a little bit troublesome. Uh, I get headaches now after I did. But I, I've I've dived on on the Great Barrier Reef and uh, and in Kauai and in the Caribbean. It's, 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 it's really, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I recommend so I, it when you're younger, when you're younger, if you have a chance, go diving. It's I did that. I did the, uh, when I was in Boy Scouts, there was a school that did it. And so you did your first few lessons in the pool and I just couldn't get past the breathing, the canned air. It just, mm. it didn't, it didn't work for me. So I didn't end up pursuing that. I was perfectly happy floating on top of the water and not crawling around under it. Yeah, snorkeling um, is great. Truthfully, snorkeling is great fun. It's and I've diving, done that. Diving is only modest. Is it, it's it's somewhat of an improvement, but the truth is, you get a, a, a you know fifty or sixty percent of the value is just by snorkeling over coral reefs. So, yeah. Um, so be, obviously, we've been at this for for an hour and, and twenty minutes, and this is you know towards the end of the the interview. But before we let you go, was there anything about the Burning Tower in the Secret Journey series that we didn't ask that you want to tell us? Well, I, I'd like to mention this this aspect, and that is that in The Lord of the Rings and in most, most other fantasies, authors tend to shy away from dealing with religion. And I very much wanted to make religion an important part of the story. Not only did I want to have my characters grounded with a belief system, but I wanted to have them run into different belief systems. 
Um, and, you know, they're clearly inspired by the belief systems that we find in Asia, Buddhism and Taoism and uh, Shinto to a lesser extent. Um, but I absolutely want to have that. And I wanted to show how people's uh, beliefs influenced their decisions and how they reacted to things. Um, and really the fact that my characters are, are uh, some of them are very, very quite strong believers. Uh, it, it plays a significant role in, in how they approach the problem and what they think the, what they think they ought to be doing. And I've always regarded it as a weakness in Tolkien that he shied away from discussing religion. Um, it needed, in my opinion, it needed, it needs to be dealt with. I mean, he's, he was a very devout Catholic, uh, and for some reason he felt that it would be inappropriate or perhaps sacrilegious even to invent a, a religion and then, and then address it. So he absolutely shies away from all discussion of religion. And I, I wanted to make that a, an important part. Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting aspect of the world to me. I think it's absolutely essential to human nature. People believe in re religions and it matters to them. You can't just sort of pretend, oh, there's no religion in my fantasy world. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. So did you, when you use the religions, are you, you know, superimposing earth religions on this place or did you sort of skin it so that way it's its its own unique thing? No, I, did, I, I absolutely made it my own unique thing. It, it would, in fact, be sacrilegious, in my opinion, to introduce Jesus into the story, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, unless you're just really just doing an alternate take. It's an alternate version of human history, and it's like the dividing line happens after after Christianity emerges on the, on the world. But nevertheless, the religions that I created clearly are related to, they have analogs, they're inspired by religions that have existed in the past. Um, I'm very fond of of, uh, of the religion, the, the Persian religion, Zoroasterism. Um, uh, I'm fond of Mithraism. I think it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, Buddhism and Taoism are both interesting to me. <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay. So um, you mentioned that there are, there are audiobooks for all of these. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, audiobooks for all of them. And I added music to them too. So they're actual multimedia audiobook presentations. What made you decide to do them yourself? Hmm. Uh, part of it is that I wanted to, uh, in the event that I keel over dead the next day, um, I wanted to leave my recreation of the stories uh, in my voice uh, for my children and, and hopefully grandchildren. Um, so that was that was a major motivation. Uh, and the other motivation really is that one of my sons says, I'm, I, I don't have the time to read your books, but I'll listen to the audio version. <laughs> that that makes sense because that's one of the things that, you know, in, in, in the modern military, at least, the idea that you're not really dead until they don't remember or they don't say your name, sort of like yeah. When you lose friends that way, it's, uh, you know, as long as we keep telling their stories, they're still with us kind of thing. Right. right. Um, and, and, you know, there's that, at least from the era I was in, which was a unique period in the army, you know, it was the, you know, we'll see them again till Valhalla was a common expression um, mm -hmm. because it was a warrior culture. And so we sort of draw on that. So I like the idea that you, that you did that. I think that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Thank you. So. Uh, I, if, right, I was an actor in high school and, and uh, it's, it's, I, I deliberately chose not to pursue acting as a, as a vocation, um, but it was a choice. I could have gone into it. Uh, I, I enjoy reading. I enjoy dramatic uh, presentations. Uh, and I, I really have, I've enjoyed uh, creating, uh, doing readings of my books. It's, it's, it's fun. It gives me, gives me a chance to, to, to try and 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 approach uh, the books and invent characters a little bit better, perhaps than than how I wrote them. But anyways, I I I enjoy them. I, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about doing audiobooks until I can't. Okay, uh, and since we have some of our listeners happen to be families that listen together, and they're all avid readers but some of their kids are a little bit on the younger side. What would the age range be that would be okay to read this story in this That's series? That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, in, in my opinion, I have stayed pretty darn close to what Tolkien wrote. 
in his books. So yes, people are killed. Yes, there's a certain amount of bloodshed, but I know I try and avoid gore. Um, I actually do have characters that fall in love and uh, have sex and get married, but it's all very decorous in my opinion <laughs> um uh, uh these aren't these aren't sort of bodice ripper romances but it is the case that uh these people do in fact you know that's another thing that is i, I as an historian i know this extremely well um all military armies up until really the present day have had camp followers and it's just this is the way it is uh, uh and uh sometimes these women get pregnant and bear children and now the camp followers have got children coming along i mean it it literally is pivotal in some of the battles following the death of alexander the great um which i know very well uh so the, the this whole aspect that when you have young men are out traveling and they're basically heroic characters they're going to end up having relations with women so I don't I don't shy away from this, but I don't. It's not a centerpiece. It's kind of it's it's pretty much in the background. But yes, the, my character. So what is an age range? I think it's reasonable for people that are ten years old to listen to this. So and this is something that we I didn't ask, but maybe I should have asked it earlier when we we're talking about the culture. So you did mention that you know you have some experience with um, with Asian cultures in your family. And yep. you've certainly yep. studied it if you wrote a book about the history of Vietnam. Uh, so how do you go about, you know, creating or paying homage to those characters, cultures that aren't your own without, you know, one being pandering or two, you know, making something that's unreadable. So how did you go about, you know, being both respectful and entertaining? I'm an expert. I literally know more about Chinese history and culture than 99.99% .99 of the U S population. <laughs> If I can't write it reasonably, no one can. So it was mostly the, in the prep work is, is how you, you do it respectfully is what you're saying? Yeah, I, I literally have devoted 20, 30 years of my life in addition to other things to researching Chinese history and culture. And, and my first wife was in fact Vietnamese, um, which accounts for why it was that I wrote a book of Vietnamese history. So yeah, I, I know this stuff. <laughs> it's not okay. easy. It's not easy, but uh, yeah, I'm an expert. Did you have to learn the language to be able to make that happen or? I have not learned Chinese, um, but I, um, I take comfort in the fact that one of the great Chinese historians of the past, La Tourette, Keith La Tourette, did not know Chinese either. So <laughs> it is possible to master that uh, uh, history and culture without actually learning the language. But it is not easy. It's not easy. There is a heck of a lot going on there. I'm very grateful to the fact that we have a, a very large number of translations of very important works that have recently appeared, like within the last 30 years. When I went to college, most of these things that I rely on had not been translated, and now they have been. And it's just, it's wonderful to be able to read these things. Um, I'm th particularly thinking about the stories of Feng Meng Long, Ling Meng Chu, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, histories or quasi histories that date from the period of 400 and 450. Um, uh, a lot of this stuff, it literally hadn't been translated until the year 2000. I, I will say, you know, one of the things I did as a graduate intern, I studied history as a graduate student. And uh, they actually have machines where they're starting to, and it's gotten better, I imagine, since I was in grad school where they're starting to digitize some of these works that were so rare and old that you couldn't touch them. And they found a way where you can essentially scan or photocopy them if you would uh, digitally without actually touching the page uh, with, with some special um, equipment, like you said, and that was back in 06, 07 when I was in grad school. So I, I imagine that has helped a lot, the ability to uh, make the stuff more accessible to people outside of just pure academics which opens things up to translations because the, some of the stuff that I was um, transcribing that way was actually written in ancient German. And I, you know, I barely made it out of German in high school and college. So I certainly wasn't speaking ancient dialects of it. Uh, so I, I imagine that has helped in modern times as well. Well, there's a funny story I can tell about that one. My professor, one of my professors of history when I was an, an undergrad, um, had a very amusing story about his work that he had to do in the city of Siena in Italy. 
and he had to butter up the archivist for the city of Siena, and he would only be allowed in to inspect the Siena archives for a few hours a day, and this was after he had successfully buttered up the Siena archivist. That stuff, the a lot of the ancient uh, documents are under lock and key in Europe and in China, and you can't get at them even in the modern era because this is literally how these people make their living, and this is how they have their power and essentially their respect within their tiny, tiny community of archivists is I'm the only one who's doing research on this area, and I'm not letting strangers in to look at these things because God knows what books they would write. So it's nice that we live in a world in which th stuff can be digitized and such, but I, <laughs> I'm skeptical as to whether this is actually going to produce a significant change, not in our lifetime. We have to move past this point where we have to have archivists who have made their life's goal is to control that information. I mean, the papal archives, for example, have not been revealed, not been opened. That's an interesting issue I hadn't thought of. Um, at least in the grad school I went to, it wasn't a problem, but I could see how that could be. I know some cultures um, are jealously guarding it. I know thinking specifically if anyone ever watched the uh, Egyptologists mm. and their their um, organization that protected that, they get very touchy about that kind of stuff. So I could see how, you know, more broadly that could be a problem. Yeah, but, but all right. It's a wonderful thing. And, and I certainly, you know, if I were to live for another hundred years, I would expect that, in fact, almost everything would be available online in, 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 in digitized form. But uh, I don't think I'll live to see it. <laughs> uh, you never know. Give Elon Musk a few more years and he might invent that tech too. <laughs> right after Starlight. There's a, finally there's a wonderful, speaking of science fiction, there's a wonderful, wonderful scene in, in the, the, the great novel um, Rainbow's Ed, End by Werner Vinge, in which the entire library of UC San Diego is digitized. And the way they do it is they put all the books through a gigantic shredder and they blow them through this tube and all the various pieces of paper in tiny as they are, 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 are photographed. And then the books are, are reassembled and uh, digitally. And, and that's how, I mean, it's the craziest, craziest scene. It, it's literally one of the most horrific and yet weirdly plausible scenes I think I've ever read. Can you imagine that? We're going to digitize the entire library by, chopping up every single book we have and just photocopying the shredded pieces of paper. Verna Vinge is a genius. That's one of the greatest scenes I've ever read. <laughs> Can you imagine that having to be the guy that's like, are you sure about this? Because, you know, there's no going back if you're I know, wrong. I know. There's absolutely no going back. <laughs> this is a one-way job. <laughs> it's crazy. And, and, no one would ever do this. No one would ever, no longer no, no. Would allow that. I, I can't. I mean, I just remember I went through when I did my, um, class on the strikers for light infantry, you know, refamiliarization at uh, at one a certain guard base in Vermont. And they happened to have some, you know, World War II newspapers that they glued onto wood and then like lacquered on to make it. And I'm just thinking like the historian in me was like, no, that's not how you preserve it. They'll, you know, like that's not <laughs> what you do. So I can't imagine the idea of just throwing something. I, I'd die inside. I couldn't do it. I agree. I agree. But I go to yard wonderful. sales and try to rescue the old books. Scene. I mean, that scene was so memorable. It's a great book. I hardly recommend that book. Rainbow's <laughs> Edge is one of the greatest near future books I've ever read. But that scene is just, it lives in my mind. It is just so horrific to imagine slicing up all these books. But it's like, but the end goal is good. We, we got the whole library digitized in just 10 days. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I, that, that definitely sounds like it'd be something that sticks with you. All right, dear listener, you've stuck with us rambling about history, so we won't bore you anymore if you're not interested in that. But before we let you go, we'd like to remind you to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books, so do your part. Uh, Colin, as we let you go, can you please tell us how they can find you on the Wild Wild Interwebs? Well, I have a website, uh, historicfantasybooks.com, and I am on Twitter at uh, C. Glassy Author. Um, and um, I used to have a Facebook page, but I've become disenchanted with Facebook as a platform, so I don't think that's uh, worth uh, worrying about. Um, and uh, who knows whether or not I, I will actually bite the bullet and start doing YouTubes. 
people have been telling me to, and I probably should. So, but that's that's all in the future. Okay, and you can find us, dear listener, on our Twitter at twitter.com backslash sf underscore fantasy underscore show. Again, Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades, where you could support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the light on. Or you can support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast. And I promise I will keep my co-hosts, Doc Seska and Nick Garber, duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. But uh, be that as it may, we appreciate you spending your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.